Yeah, so you have the light-based ones, and um, they're better than taking that 2700 number off the box of factory ammo, with the caveat that you set it up right. All right, everybody, this is everything you need to know to get up to speed on chronographs. Mark, you know uh, where I got that intro from? Uh, Jim, I'm going to guess it was some sort of car-related YouTube channel. That's right. I didn't do it to the same level as the presenter who normally does it, but that's because I didn't want to embarrass myself trying to be too much. You know, I was gonna. I was expecting a little more, a little more gas, just, Jim. You said you're gonna do I'll leave it. That to the, the whole, professionals. You should tell everybody what it is. Well, no, I'm gonna leave it up to people to uh, to guess. If you if you know what that's from, why don't you just throw a comment in real fast? Um, okay. But you were correct. You were on the right path. Anyway. Well, I didn't want to give it away because I wasn't sure if you wanted to give it away. And then no, That's all right. That's I, all right. I know what it is. I know the answer. You do. You do. I got uh, the answers to the test early. More importantly, back to the topic of chronographs. Um, we, do, uh, we do a little something. We talk about something here a lot. Muzzle velocity. And um, the guys across the table, I'm sure, can tell us why that's such an important thing to know. Uh, across the table, we have Mr. Tony Paulskill and Ian Clem. And so uh, that's, that's two people from kind of our secret squirrel area of the building that we've actually gotten on at once. That's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty impressive. You know, going to want to document this one for the history books. Uh, well, I'd say this, Jim. It's also two people from two of our highest listened, listened to podcasts. So we've, yeah. we've combined them. Here so you, you, go. you guys, uh, maybe we're set up for like a supercast. That's right, supercast. <laughs> um, so chronographs come in many different shapes and sizes. Like we said, generally speaking, are used to. to uh, yeah, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you're going to see all the various different shapes and sizes that we could that we could scrounge together. Um, and uh, yeah, all of them measure a pretty important, uh, pretty important figure there for us in our ballistics. So, guys, why? Uh, why is first off, you know, these are these are capturing the muzzle velocity, the uh, velocity of our round as it leaves the end of the barrel. Why is that such an important figure in what we uh, what we have to do, you know, what we need to figure for the whole shot? Um, for what I use them uh, majority of them for is that muzzle velocity is very important because no matter if you change a powder charge, like for me and personally, and I know Ian as well, we both hand load, so you got to make sure that your muzzle velocity is correct because when you well, you have to make sure you know what your muzzle velocity is. That way you can put it back into like whatever ballistic solver that you're using, maybe a phone or a handheld, um, so you can plug in that, in, that correct information. Because if you look on the back of the box, you know, like every manufacturer out there, they have, it's based off of um, a certain barrel length. Well, from myself and what probably Ian runs is two different lengths of barrels. If we were to put my, my ammo into his gun, I mean, it's a longer barrel, it's probably going to go a little faster, which, but if I gave my muzzle velocity, it would be incorrect for his barrel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. utilizing uh, these devices, it'll give you that opportunity to put in the correct uh, 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 part of that s solution that you need. Yeah. yeah, Tony really hit on it because even when you buy a box of factory ammo, oftentimes there'll be a velocity on there. Um, well, that velocity isn't really a one-size-fits-all. It's, it's sort of a nominal value that they're giving the consumer so that that person knows Oh, okay. Yeah, I can tell my buddy that you know my 270 is shooting 2,700 feet per second or something like that. Yeah. Well, in reality, you know that was fired out of a very specific rifle, very specific barrel at that manufacturer's lab where they captured that that um, information. And um, yeah, you put that same factory ammo into Jimmy's rifle, Mark's rifle. It's going to be a little bit different, not only for the barrel length, but there's other dimensions inside the barrel. Like in our barrel podcast, we talked about lands and grooves and bore diameter and, um, all those things contribute to what we call internal ballistics, which is what happens inside that bore. And everything that happens inside that bore goes into producing one of a couple numbers being muzzle velocity. As soon as that bullet exits the barrel, now we're talking external ballistics, and people are really interested in external ballistics because that's what, understanding that realm lets them hit their target, whether it be mm. a game animal, a, a, a paper target, a steel target. Um, so it's one of the most important inputs if you want to be able to deterministically or predictively say, well, my bullet is going to do this downrange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Now, like, sometimes you'll see the number on the back of the box that say it says 2,700 feet per second or something like that. 
and then you uh, you chronograph it, which again we'll get into this whole process and all these different types. But you chronograph it, and maybe your round is leaving the barrel at like twenty six forty or something like that. So there's a sixty foot uh, per second discrepancy. But you think, you know, I mean, I remember when I first got into shooting, I'd think to myself, okay, twenty six forty versus twenty seven hundred, like what percentage difference is that? That's not that huge. It can't make that big of a difference, right? But it 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 can make a pretty significant difference actually i mean being off by you know a few tens of feet per second or even just i mean depending on what you're doing ian i'm sure in f class and some of that bench rest shooting and stuff like that you guys heaven forbid you're off by more than right three or four feet per second or something like that oh catastrophic uh but what would the uh what is the big big deal with that why is it that just such little differences in the muzzle velocity can wind up causing such big discrepancies downrange well you know what's really important is to define what downrange means. Mm. I'll give you an example. You brought up bench rest. Well, there's short range bench rest, 100 yard bench rest, right? Those guys don't even measure their powder charges. They're loading rounds at the range because they're probably using the same 10 pieces of brass. They'll shoot a match at 8 o'clock in the morning. They'll go and load those right at their bench and then shoot another match at 9 o'clock in the morning with mm. the same pieces of brass. But they're not measuring the powder charges in between load sessions. When you say, well, what are they doing? Using a scoop? And they're using a fancy scoop, basically. It's a volumetric style powder thrower. So they don't know how much it weighs. They don't know what the charge weighs. They just know that the little dial on their Culver style powder measure is reading 30 clicks or 32 uh, units intervals. And so they throw their powder charge and it fills the case. They seat the bullet and they shoot and they shoot these tiny little groups, the smallest groups of any of any sport shooting sport there is how can they do that yeah Mm -hmm. how can they do that if they're not measuring by weight the powder charge right i mean because that's something we talk about like oh you want to be accurate like we've done some stuff with some yeah you get all these different nodes and you're like well my group was better exactly so but the key here is they're shooting at 100 yards so like we talk about doing load development when tony and i do uh, uh an initial ladder charge where we're sweeping probably three full grains of powder charge for a roughly 40-ish grain case, right. that's a big delta between the lightest load and the, and the hottest load, right? If we shot that ladder at 100 yards, it would probably be one hole. It'd be a ragged, big, oh, you know, okay. half-inch hole, okay. but it would they'd, they'd all go roughly into the same spot. We have to add distance to actually see some of the discrepancy that velocity, muzzle velocity differences will make in your exterior ballistics. So if we push that ladder charge out to 300 yards, now all of a sudden we see this vertical string of shots and you're getting more vertical dispersion as a result of that difference Mm -hmm. in muzzle velocity. Okay. And another thing is I think is the terminology like you're saying, Jimmy, is about the back of that. Now, if you're using that 270 and you're going to get a discrepancy of uh, 60 feet a second and you're going deer hunting it's really not that big of a deal okay. what we're yeah. talking is is if you're trying to if you're tar- basically your tel- target's got to be relative to on how accurate you need to be like ian just was saying like you know you go to they they're doing a hunter i never knew about this until you just probably just said it but um they didn't know that they just scooped it in you know that's pretty amazing but um but like for you know you got your deer you got a you know eight ten inch target you know you can you can give a little bit this way if you're shooting really small targets like you know he's shooting at distance and i'm going to a prs match and i'm shooting small targets at distance it kind of goes back on what he was saying about you have to get now distance out there so now that 60 feet a second (laughs) does make a difference yeah you know i think people yeah sometimes i mean you forget yeah 60 feet now it's of course slowing down the the second it leaves the barrel too so then that velocity Mm -hmm. is changing over the course of time but right even 60 feet a second 60 feet's Notable. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Sometimes guys are trying to figure out their max effective range for a long game or a long, uh, long range ish hunt. You know, maybe it's 500 yards. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but are there certain states that have, they impose like a kinetic energy on target minimum for certain class game? I mean, so yes and no. It's been a while since I've even had to think about that. I know when I lived in Nebraska, like, uh, and if it's changed or if I'm saying this incorrectly, you know, let me know. But it was something like uh, you could use a 5.56 five, for deer as I want, as long as it had, like, I want to say, like, 900 foot-pounds at 100 yards or that something sounds, like that. sounds something like that, yeah. Um, 
So and that, that's the only one I've ever really, I guess, looked at. I lived that there for a while. I was like, oh, that's an interesting regulation. I never used a, yeah. you know, two, two, three, or five, five, six, you know, for deer. But it was yeah. cool that like, you know, like oh, maybe I want to get my son or daughter into shooting, or somebody's super recoil sensitive. We're not going to be shooting that far. We'll probably be shooting a hundred yards, and then right. there were ways to, you know, do that. Um, yeah. I think it had to be another. Um, a specific grain of bullet too actually though there was yeah. there was some stuff going on there, usually yeah. usually it's it's foot pounds of energy on target because you know you need mass and velocity to drive that right mm-hmm. well you know your mass your bullet isn't losing weight as it's flying through the air um and you can figure out what your retained velocity or, or your impact velocity is if you know your muzzle velocity so if you want to be uh, either on the right side of the law or you've you've set a threshold ethically for yourself saying CPX2 class game I'm going to make sure it's 100 foot pounds of energy and I'm not going to shoot past that that distance then you can you can uh, calculate that figure with muzzle velocity mm-hmm. yeah. I'm going to actually have to have you expound on expound on a CPS class 2 game Oh yeah I, I, it's question, that's actually. like all the ruminants less elk or something like that I forget what okay. the definition is. It's like the the deer species. I don't know. Man, I've like looked at a lot of like game regulations and read a lot about deers and elks and that's you not something one. new every day. Well we're kinda of paused here. I also I have to turn this thing because Ian I and keep, I, I are keep like it's trying like, to make eye contact to through the gap. Look through one of <laughs> we, um, we're turning the chronograph. Uh, this is this is also moderately off topic while we're slightly paused, but Ian, I'm surprised that you said that the bullet's not losing uh, mass or whatever as it as it flies through the air. Because I was just figuring that would be one of those things where, you know, I, normally you would think that it's not, but then somebody like Ian or Tony comes along, you're like, well, actually, the air resistance is peeling. But then it made me wonder, does anybody account for the copper deposit that their bullet leaves in the barrel as it, as it exits down the barrel to, like, slightly reduce the grain weight? Like, does I anybody get that does. nerdy? Remember Niles from the F class? Yeah, um, yeah, splitting yeah. He might, kernels. He might, he might I bet account he for that. I bet he does. Yeah, Niles, to let us know. If that's something. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but back to back to chronographs. Um, you know, we 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 know, and we've kind of explained a little bit why. You know, it's it's such an important thing. I think the gist of it is, if you're if you're just getting to this in more layman terms, I'd say, or, or you're just beginning. Knowing your muzzle velocity, that's probably that's going to be one of the the most important, I would say, variables you can plug into a general ballistics calculator. I've got an app on my phone. I know that I use. Lots of other people do the same thing. Some people use a Kestrel device or something like that. But one of the first things it's going to ask you is what the muzzle velocity of your round is. And the more the more finite and more uh, exact with the information you can get into your ballistics calculator. Everybody says put good in, good get get good out. Uh, the better. So then as you start knowing, you know, pressures and temperatures and elevation, all that stuff, that that works on top of them, the muzzle velocity. Um, but it is going to be one of the first and foremost things that you uh, that you want to try and find out. But not everybody has a chronograph. Maybe people are looking to get a chronograph. Your range might have one to use, but it could look anything like one of the four that we have here on the table. Um, so we're going to kind of go through some of the different ones <coughs> here. And uh, pros, cons of each, how they're used a little bit, um, and certainly there might be some other things that we go off on little rabbit trails uh, as we're along the way. But sound right to you, Mark? I mean, I think it. I think it sounds great. I mean, we're all we we've done a lot of podcasts on long range shooting or F class, and we always talk about the importance of getting an accurate velocity. Mm-hmm. But we've never really talked about the tools that you do that with. Right. So. I feel like the natural place is one of those ones where actually I think I do know where to start. Is kind of the ones that people would be most familiar with, right? Like the old classic chronographs. Yeah. We've yeah. got we've got sort of one and a half of them on the table here. The one the one furthest back between you and Ian. It's kind of an old style one, but it's it's like a revamped new old style one. I don't know. This is interesting because this is the first time I've ever seen this one. I don't know if you've run across it. I've never seen it before. But at first I what the heck is going on here? And then I just recognized, oh, it's the traditional light-based chronograph. They just flipped <laughs> it upside down. Maverick style, yeah. Yeah. inverted. I wonder, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's just more stable. But it, how did yeah, you measure way. the velocity? It was inverted. I was inverted. The chronograph was <laughs> inverted. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, so can you guys go into explaining, um, this, is the, uh, this is the one that looks like, oh, I don't know, it looks sort of like a, green army men thing at the base with like two metal 
wire things sticking out. I'm going to go with two old school TV antennas on it, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what they look like. Yep. It does. And this, uh, the rabbit ears. whatever this polymer is, is it's the pseudo tinfoil across the top. I like that. Very Rube Goldberg y, though. Kind of, I don't know. There's, it looks fragile to me. <laughs> Ian doesn't like it. I don't like it. He's mm-hmm. not a fan. Um, let, let me ask. So Ian was talking a little bit about light here. So maybe let's yeah. talk about what is a chronograph and how is it working? And I think we have, you know, about at least three examples that are probably working, dif- oh, doing the same thing very differently. very differently. Absolutely. That, and then mm-hmm. that is a perfect place to start. Uh, the fundamental technology, what's allowing them to do what they're doing and what is it that they're doing? They're measuring a velocity of a projectile. So we're talking Newtonian physics. The projectile could be a bullet. It could be an arrow. Um, it could be a loaf of bread. Is yeah, yeah. it could be okay. a loaf of bread. All right. Um, <laughs> we'll just go with that. Soaring through the air. And, and, what we have is three fundamental different technologies. So to simplify it, oversimplify it, I guess, you've got light, you've got sound, and then you've got magnetism, which is kind of cool. That is cool. Wow. They're yeah. all actually really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So the first ones to come out were the light-based ones. And these are basically the same unit. This one is upside down um, as it works. But uh, for light-based systems, it doesn't really matter. It's uh, You've got some emitters that are in the green plastic housings here so the emitter would be here you need a pair of them two of them and it shines a light a beam of light and i think it they've got a um, diffraction grating in there so that the beam sort of like spreads out like this and you you can think of it like a light curtain like it's a plane of light right that something's going to try and pass through and then there's a sensor that's looking for a shadow, a shadow of whatever it is that passes through that that sort of beam of light. So the accuracy of these is, you can imagine, is really dependent on are those two light planes uh, parallel to each other? Is there a little bit of angular offset to them? Oh, yeah. And if there is a little bit of angular offset, just in the fact that you, think you can only manufacture these molded um, you know, housing so well. Right. Well, then you're going to get a little bit different velocity if you shoot at this end of the of the device versus down at this end of the device because maybe those light patterns are are separated a little bit. Huh. So it's the distance between the two sensor pairs that's doing the calculation based on um, the time that it takes for the bullet to break the plane here and break the plane there. Right. I mean, because essentially you're measuring time yeah. and that's giving you i guess number. essentially yeah. the number that that you're coming up with and i from the sounds of it when i was doing i was trying to do some some precast research jim as i always like to do that's where mm. i get my printouts uh only one today when i started my most of the things that you if you google chronograph most of the things that pop up are actually watch related what's that Oh, like a chronograph watch, which has a uh, like a time, like a timer on it. Oh, you know, like the three little dials, and hence the word. Right. Yeah. Which is, I thought, I thought that was kind you're, of you're uh, graphing time, kind yeah. of interesting. Yeah, so. a lot of people go for the old chronograph look now. I opted for the simple watch face. You are. Using I used to be kind of a watch nerd. Not anymore. It's a real nice watch. You've simplified your life. So anyway, that was that was one thing that I found curious. Now, a guy like this that's using light. Is it sensitive to light then? Like what you're talking about, like it's looking for what a shadow. Well, what night? if you're in the shadow of a tree? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So you just talked about the big disadvantage. You can elaborate on it because you probably you've d- used them more than I have. Well, that that's the one thing is like it depends on your um, sunlight based off of this one and this one I've noticed as well. But um, the old school one that I had back in the day, it was if, especially if these – God forbid if any of these got shot, because that's what normally happens. It, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it's because it's, it, you back up. You're not putting your barrel. It's got, you know, determine. Uh, what did they used to back. recommend or still do? Maybe 15 I, it's, feet? Oh, it's been so long. But you're just like, oh, every time you pull the trigger, you're just like, oh, what you do do I have any? And you, you and you'll see, like, people have used them a lot, and like especially the old timers. Like, you go to the range. And there's like little nicks on the side of these, like yeah. somewhere along yeah. with, within it, or they somehow got hit up here at the top. Um, Is that because you want like only the bullet passing through there versus like maybe I don't know powder or disturbance or muzzle blast or? No, it. I think it's well. The thing is, like backing it up is just so you don't get this. 
Oh, a lot it's, of shaking. Yeah, you're because oh. you're you're getting. I mean, these I notice that if you if you would get blast on them and you would have this going on. Okay. So then you think you're. Oh, I'm just yeah. gonna shoot again. Well, then it already went like this. So oh, then you get, gotcha. Yeah, so yeah you don't want the unit to move without you thinking or what without you knowing because then then you've done the. Uh, uh, yeah, I think shot us. I think that's that's absolutely correct. But I think Mark probably hit on another one: is that you don't want some of that unburned powder or expansion gas, that because that can create a shadow it's of itself. Yeah. Eject uh, other stuff that might be going out yeah. ahead of the bullet. I just feel like in general, these ones are sort of looked at nowadays as um, just not that accurate. Mm. And, and I mean, there's. It seems as though maybe there's a chance you could get an accurate reading out of it, but there's so many weird little finicky things with it that it's not. Well, you have to remember. So um, back in the day, those shooting crony, you know, the first ones to come out, I think they still sell them. They were like a hundred dollars. They were like eighty dollars mm-hmm. to maybe one hundred and twenty dollars. Okay. Um, but there was a scientific grade version of the light based one uh, made by a company, a German company, Oler, I think you pronounce okay. it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. And uh, it was like, it was like fifteen hundred dollars or oh something, wow, something. it was it was industry like like the standard, like yeah, the, the high level industry standard. Kind so of. like if you were a, a munitions manufacturer, you would buy one of those to put in your lab to to put that twenty seven hundred feet per second on your box or something. Okay. Um, so I think the level to which it was manufactured to make sure that those sensors were well calibrated and stayed well calibrated, that's what you were paying for. Okay. And I think the plus or minus 5% that you might see advertised on one of these is a, a function of the limits of mass manufacturing, a consumer commodity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably better than nothing. Yeah. You know, and it gives you, a, an, again, at least some sort of baseline to compare to the back yeah. of your box and, well, what and would go you guys, off of. What would you guys rather have? Would you rather have somebody, let's say, go off of a of a box muzzle velocity or go off of a muzzle velocity gotten from or obtained through a chronograph that either they weren't using properly or wasn't giving accurate data. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, what, what's, if, what's the geez. worst of, of two evils there? It probably depends. I'm sure. Cause like, yeah, you know, it's like over a game of over. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do an end around and say like, here's a workaround. You never have to buy a chronograph, but you know, before I could afford a chronograph, I don't know if you ever did this, but it was it was a game of going on to the free online ballistic apps like JBM mm-hmm. and JBM. getting a getting yeah getting a drop, and then playing with the numbers until you back calculated a velocity and said, oh that's, yeah, that must be distance. my muzzle velocity so yeah to a distance as long as you know your uh, BC was and then you just turn around and you just <laughs> as yeah. long as you had a solid BC and so then it's you a just, you just reverse so if you hit the distance at and I'll say three mils and you. And you come up on your JBM as, you know, three mils, you were good. If not, you adjusted your muzzle velocity, and, yeah. and then you kind of trued up your muzzle velocity is what you're really So here's, here's kind of the potential problem with that. Let's say the range that you had available to you to get your drop, your one known that you were going to use, was 400 yards. And that gave you, with a published BC, mm-hmm. you could sort of back calculate your velocity like we just described. Laborious process, but you could do it. That's what I used to do. But you haven't. You're still dealing with one known, and that was that 400 yard distance. Mm-hmm. The velocity that you back calculated that is it's, it's supposition based on based on the the premise that your BC is what it was published to be. Right. So you've got two unknowns and one known. You're never quite going to be able to validate perfect the yeah. BC and the muzzle velocity. I was wondering Correct. that one because because yeah, you see people a lot of times what we're getting at for those for those scratching your heads right now is the idea of getting a muzzle velocity without a chronograph. And so you essentially you'll shoot at a distance that's a known distance and you'll kind of have a ballpark of what your muzzle velocity might be, but then you just um, see what drop you had in inches and yeah, the ballistics calculators like you guys are discussing, you can you can fudge the numbers on your muzzle velocity until what you saw in real life for drop you see that match up, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So you're like, okay, yeah, this should be. But I always wondered that because I'm like, there's lots of other variables that can make the bullet drop the way that it dropped. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, are you just tweaking one number to get what you want to see or? Yeah. So what you're doing is you're using like a characteristic uh, equation and it ends up being, I don't know, some fourth or fifth order polynomial that describes this trajectory. And you're saying, okay, fudge that number being muzzle velocity until the, that, characteristic equation drops 
the amount that I saw it drop when I shot this morning. That one distance. Mm-hmm. But the curve might not be correct. And the reason why it might not be correct is because, well, the, the manufacturer says the BC of this bullet is X. Mm-hmm. Well, there's other things that affect BC, like twist rate of your barrel. You know, there's a potential BC for and that bullet. And the actual speed, too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a dynamic kind of kind of figure. That's why these custom drag curves are are useful and and um, mm-hmm. an advancement because before we were just sort of like sliding this characteristic, you know, this generic curve, and it would be the right solution, but only at 400 yards. Okay, you know, mm-hmm. you go to 500 and mm-hmm. it's off. not fidelic anymore. You're yeah, you're, off. you're off. Well, and also you have the you know the human element there too. Like you know h- how how consistent of a group can you personally shoot at 400 yards or 500 right. yards or right. whatever, you know, distance you're trying to yep. validate, you know, quotation mark validate your data. Like yep. you might have a shooting characteristic that maybe you're always, you know, pushing the muzzle down a little, mm. I don't know. Or and like, you know, or like Jimmy said, other environmentals, like if you had a headwind, that's usually traditionally going to push that bullet down. Oh, so you'll yeah, have sure. more drop. Right. It's not real drop. It's just atmospheric, you know, push and rifle capability. Mm-hmm. So you, you start throwing it and you're off. And your gun, I mean, you're doing everything as a shooter, right? It just a gun, yeah. maybe mm-hmm. only maybe only hold a minute. So you know? that's a good job of describing what if you didn't have a chronograph? Well, there's there's room for improvement, right? You know, yeah. you're mm-hmm. you're coming up short a little bit. Enter these guys, mm-hmm. yeah. So you have the light based ones, and um, they're better than taking that 2700 number off the box of factory ammo, with the caveat that you set it up right. And you're not, you don't have a gross error. Use common sense. Like if it, if you keep coming up with a 1500 feet a second, yeah. like you know something's going wrong when you know that traditionally that projectile would be going 2700 feet a second, plus or minus, let's say 40, 50. If you're not getting those numbers, you're probably doing something wrong. You don't don't, don't, don't plug in 2000 feet a second yeah. into, into your solver or and if go, you. Or if yeah. you shoot once, like we did when we did not set that one up right. So that, that purchase right there was a very hastily hastily made purchase in a sportsman's before the Vortex Extreme one year that Eric Barber and I made. And we did not set it up correctly. And I remember that it was like, we shot the first round, and I was like, 2,400 feet per second. That seems low. Mm-hmm. It was six five Creedmoor. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then we shot again, and I was like, oh, there we go. There's uh, there's 27, 25. Just needed to warm up. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, yeah, then we shot again. It was like 26. Wait a minute. No. That's, and, a, that's, a, that's a pretty yeah. rough SD, Jim. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, that was, real, that was not single-digit <laughs> SDs. Um, but, yeah, that, that, was, that was one way that we knew yep. uh, we had to go find yeah. somebody with a, with a better chronograph, or at least one that could be set up properly. But um, the the whole, like, is it a sunny day? Is it a cloudy day? Um, you know, that's why you see these you see these plastic shields. The oh, okay. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's trying to... It's kind of like a sunshade, This shade, one has I guess. Yeah. yeah. Did you see these, the lights in the base? Oh, yeah, look at that. Like Little what, LEDs. I don't know why you would want to shine light back up into the emitters. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe that's not even what that is. All those nighttime chronographers, maybe. <laughs> or maybe this is maybe they've maybe they've uh, made more improvements than I than I thought at first, and maybe these are the emitters and the sensor, the receivers up, just the receivers oh. up there. Oh, that could be. Yeah, interesting. It looks a little bit more durable, though. At least. Yeah, know. that one could take maybe like two rounds. <laughs> so extruded, <laughs> extruded aircraft grade aluminum. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, that's so. This guy's using light. Then. That that's the light one. Let's move on to uh, some of the other ones. Which one should we go to first? Uh, Let's do the magneto. The magneto speed. speed. The mosquito speed mark, which is one we use quite a bit. Jim have yeah. used. So um, what's been your experience with it? Seems to give you numbers that make sense. The numbers have worked for me. Yeah. I guess within you know, I guess the general parameters of how I'm using yep. a rifle. Um, yeah, I uh, have yet to see really any issues with it. The only thing that's a bit tricky is getting it set up. Because yep. mm, yeah. you got to try and get, I mean, you guys can go into how it works exactly, but but the way you set it up and the way that it's on your barrel and it's spacing between the, the crown and, you know, all that stuff is is a bit of a of a chore. You're always using these different spacers and stuff. So can you guys go into, like, how this thing works and how it is that people are setting up what I'm getting into there? Sure. Um, so the, the core technology for this one is um, 
you know, when I talked about the light sensors and how uh, if this thing flexed or if there was a little bit of run out in manufacturing, you know, you can get some angular um, uh, misalignment between the pairs of sensors. Well, this has a pair of sensors as well, but they're uh, much more rugged and they're actually embedded into the hard part of this bayonet right here. And there's something called uh, Hall effect sensors. Uh, basically, they're, they're reading, um, uh, they're turning a magnetic, a Gaussian impulse a magnetic um, uh, field into voltage. So this sensor, there's one here, there's one here. When, during the manufacturing of this, you can imagine they can get the separation of those sensors really accurate because they're, they're probably in a jig and a mold and they're, they're molded around and, and it's very repeatable in terms of the separation distance. So that takes care of one of the potential issues with the light-based chronographs. And then um, since it's looking for a magnetic impulse of that projectile moving across uh, over top, you know, it doesn't care if it's a cloudy day, a sunny day, if it's raining, right. if it's windy, you know, it's only looking for a very specific trigger, if you will, mm -hmm. um, being that, being that bullet that passes over. Actually, I, in, in a prior life, um, was designing, um, remotely operated weapon stations, big 40 millimeter cannons, and we use the exact same thing, <laughs> but we embedded it's them. It's just like the coolest <laughs> thing ever. And it's just casual. Such, uh, yeah. Just very well oh, in passing. Yeah, well. The, it was, it was years ago, but um, <laughs> we, put, we put them in the barrel. So it was a composite barrel, and we were able to embed those sensors in the barrel and then keep wrapping the carbon fiber around it. So picture that. It just looks like a normal remotely operated 40-millimeter cannon. <laughs> yeah. But you're, you're, getting, average you're getting yeah. the velocity every single shot, and you can use that data if you want to, if you need to. That's awesome. Um, so this is using the same thing. They've got the sensors. Then, of course, that pair of sensors is, is relaying that voltage signal back to a digital readout, which is in front right. of Tony there. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's – I've always really liked these. They're compact. They go in my range bag super easy. Yeah. I know what you mean about the shims. And it's worthwhile, that little bit of uh, uh, pain in the butt to set up is worthwhile because I don't know if you've noticed this, but the closer you can get that gap between the edge of your bore and the plane of this bayonet, it seems like the more accurate it is. Yeah. The, Makes sense. The, the setup on them is, besides the shimming part, is really simple. And the I think the strong Benny of them is firing, well... Firing side by side with someone else, if you have run like the Doppler side, um, indoors is another one that they shine. Like when we go down to the indoor range, you, mm. you have to use them down there. You can't use uh, the lab radar; it won't pick up. Oh, that's another big thing. Yeah, so you're not grabbing someone else's data um, while using these. With other ones out there, you have a chance of running into them. Oh. Nice, nice part about these now is that manufacturers have seen uh, on how well they do. So what they've done, um, cause I'm a big fan of, if I'm doing practice session shooting, I love having the ability to go, if I shoot down range and my round's low, I like looking over, cause I know my use, uh, like outside I'll use the lab radar. I'll look over and go, if I have a muzzle velocity that's dropped, I know that it wasn't really me. I knew that it was just an ammo piece. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to have it with this manufacturers have come up with there's a couple of them are out there. Now you can take the same deal and have it attached somewhere along that rifle system so you can because the downfall with this one is that is that when i when i personally put them on my gun i can't do what i just described by keep shooting down range and getting muzzle velocities because i have shift ish, i mean i have a little bit of shift mm -hmm. issues with them by you mean like just point on, of impact yeah, shift? point of impact it's like shift. a giant uh harmonic yep. imbalance right yep. so what they've done is they've come up with a, or basically a rod system that moves it around there's a few of them out there so you can it's not touching your barrel anymore it's it's gotcha. mounted on the side it's based on the side so it has nothing to do with your barrel and you continuously do the same thing i just talked about yeah. like continuously shooting down range and the, but the setup is so simple. It's it's what one wire plug in fires right up. Yeah, and, and even the, the shims aren't that bad. It's just yeah. something that if it's your first time setting up a magneto oh. speed, you're gonna be like, where do I stack this? How do I? How close am I supposed to get it yep. to the? Yeah, yeah. Then you got the little square. They have that little uh, aluminum extrusion yep. quarter inch that they use as sort of like a guide to see are you close enough. Yep. Yeah. Um, it feels weird, but I I go ahead and I kind of like <laughs> make sure the gun's clear and, yep. and actually look at it from the muzzle end just to see if I can cheat a little bit closer. Right. 
Right. But um, as far as though size and weight and compacting, you said you know it fits in your range bag. Jim, do we have the do we have the case for that? We had the case. It comes in a little. Just over yonder, little, we had uh, MC Ryan. It's going to be our uh, tiny Magneto Speed briefcase. Thank you, oh sir. yeah. Uh, yeah, they come it's, in this it's thing. It's light. It's tiny. lightweight. It's it, yep. You know, even with you know, you got all the instruments in there, or whatever. And I mean, oh. I dig it. I like it. And like you said, really, one of the only drawbacks, in my opinion, which I guess when I'm shooting, I'm like, well, I'm just trying to. I'm not. I guess it could be nice to shoot for accuracy and velocity at the same time, but mm-hmm. firing five shots, you know, to get a standard, right. uh, you know, get your velocity, a good standard deviation, and crunch the numbers, like. To me, it's not that big a deal. You pull it off, and then you shoot your groups, and off you go. Right. Yeah, so I've got a very specific use case for this guy, and that is after I'm done tuning. So we've done the you know the barrel harmonics, and I've got a good condition of positive compensation that we talked about in the, in the tuning video. All that work is done. I want to just characterize, well, what velocity did I end up at? I don't yeah. really care, you know, oh, if okay. it's this fast or that fast, but I want to get a no-kidding – data point that if I had to change powder lots before the barrel was retired, I was using the same barrel and I have got to open a new powder lot, it might be a little bit different. I can go ahead and refer to that number and say, yep, sure enough, this powder lot is a little bit slower. I'm 10 feet per second slower than what my ideal velocity was. I'm going to go ahead and bump that powder charge so that I can get back to that magic velocity that was indicative of a really good tune mm-hmm. without having to go through that tuning process again. Yeah. So it's sort of like my, it becomes my, stan- my uh, standard bearer for that velocity, mm-hmm. for that specific barrel. I guess oh, and okay. actually, and that's generally actually, I think the way I'm thinking about what you're saying, I mean, that's generally, like I generally sight in my rifle, get like whatever my just spot on 100 yard zero is. And then like you said, I'm like, okay, well, what is that velocity? Now I'm going to go get my ballistic data for yeah. whatever I ended up with. And Ian, you're saying, oh, sorry, what, Tony? Uh, no, it's, and, and once you, the nice thing about, we're talking about the shims piece, once you have your shim set up that you know my use, most guys just leave them right on there and they just strap it right on, they're done. You know? right. Yeah, that's it's, easy. It's, yeah. it's your first initial, just like everything else, it's your first initial, you're kind of figuring out, you know, if you get your sporter barrel or you're running the heavy barrels that we've got, I mean, there's a difference there. But mm-hmm. once, if, it, if a guy buys one of these, it's, you basically can leave the thing on there, slide over your barrel, strap it down, turn it up, and you're, you're like set if you're up yeah. running the same gun yeah, a lot yeah, or the same yeah. maybe style. So of you're not gun re-shimming every time. It's just a one-time shim system, and then you're you golden, remember what right? that combination was for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unless you're uh, unless you're one of those guys, you just cannot bear to like have the same gun for more than a month at a time. <laughs> you're just switching guns all the time. Um, Ian, you mentioned something. It it sounded like so. Do some some guns when you're saying you're tuning, you're tuning to a velocity, so you know when a when a when a round leaves the barrel at a given velocity, it will be. Well, it will be. No, more like you're not tuning to a velocity. You're tuning period, and then you're just gonna go and say, well, here's a here's a piece of evidence that can uh, remind me what that velo- characteristic velocity was when I was tuned. So I'm not trying to hit a specific velocity or I'm not tuning to a velocity, but velocity is sort of like a fingerprint. Mm. So once that barrel is tuned, it's going to have a characteristic velocity. Mm. Just remember those bullets are exiting that barrel when it's tuned where you want them to exit. So you don't want those bullets to go slower or faster from that characteristic velocity or it'll come out of tune. It'll come out below or it'll oh, come out Oh, I get it. Okay, so yeah. you're, oh, you're yeah. going to, whatever velocity it is, doesn't matter. Yep. But you want to then, once you have that know with that, that barrel, is. you know awesome. what that is and you yep. want to try and match that. That's what I really like this for. Um, okay. Because, as Tony pointed out, it changes point of impact. And, um, you know, it, it acts like a tuner. Like, it, it's a weight on the mm-hmm. end of your barrel. Uh, but the other weird thing is, every time I put it on, um, the point of impact shift is always up. So it's always like a minute to a minute and a half higher than it would be without the... So it must there must be an interaction between the expansion gases, which are, you know, they're overtaking the bullet. They're going faster than the bullet. They're interacting with this surface, and then they're, they're causing like an artificial aerodynamic shift to the bullet oh. and kind of pushing it up. Man, that's um, some heady stuff, but it makes sense. Yeah, and it's very consistent every single time. Um, when you heard me say, oh, it's because I actually followed what Ian was saying. I know, I actually did too. <laughs> so if you, first time. if you think you've got a good shooting, <laughs> first time, <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> if, you, if you think you've got a good shooting rifle and you put this on and it shoots better, you didn't finish your homework with the tune. 
you could have you could have tuned better has that ever happened to you yeah oh yeah 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 that's a good indicator saying okay i just basically affected that barrel by adding this mass on there there was there was more precision in that specific rifle than i was squeezing out of it interesting yeah, yeah. very Okay. Or just, you know, shoot with the old magneto speed on. Be like, well. Always. Always. Always got to in that. You know, then you're always getting a velocity and a proper tune. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I tell you, That's I not, remember, by the way, that's like not, not recommend. Don't do I that. I remember the first that's, time I saw it and, 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 yeah. And the longer you keep those things on, the more you always got to check the tension on that belt and stuff. Oh. Too, so you're not shooting it on accident. But yeah. The first time I saw a magneto speed on a gun, I, I, I think it was probably, oh, I, I mean, it was, had to have been like 10 years ago or something like that. How long have they even been out? I mean, about, it was yeah, about ten years, maybe. Oh, I think they've easily been ten years. I thought some guy was like, I, I thought he had a, a replica World of Warcraft <laughs> gun or <laughs> something oh, like that. Yeah. I, I was like, look at this nerd over here, like <laughs> yeah. he's trying to make his gun look like it's out of some video game. Little did I know, he actually had a chronograph on the end of it. And right, um, yeah, they're they're kind of goofy looking when you got them going. And since I mentioned cost for this, I think the sporter version of this that I bought was somewhere around 180 bucks, something like that. That's not too bad. No, no not too bad. pretty accessible. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, how about this one? You mentioned that we've we've used light, we've used ma- used magnetism, and then sound. So the lab radar over here is this, is this orange looking thing. It looks like something you see on a construction site, um, but it's. Uh, is it newer than the Magneto Speeds? Is it kind of more like it's, fresh it's, on scene, or has it been around for a long time? I think it's the newest it's of newer, the three of of types. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a wacky thing. Um, so explain it's it's Doppler, is it not? Yeah, when I when someone said lab radar for the first time to me, I thought, well, that's kind of disingenuous. They're calling it a radar. That's going to make people think it's Doppler. And then I found <laughs> out it was Doppler, it was Doppler. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like something you could buy. I was like, whoa, that that's pretty neat. It's like the first time I heard somebody use the term hybrid, and I was like, you can't fit two engines in a car. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, when I think Doppler, too, I'm thinking about the weatherman. I'm like, oh, let's yeah. check the mm-hmm. Doppler. Oh yeah. I mean is that I mean it's the same technology. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what it says it is. What a I mean, person. It's Sorry. there's they're That's sending nice out work. they're sending out um in this in this case I think it's uh microwaves, but a but a longitudinal sound wave and they're um looking for how the frequency of that waveform changes on the reflection when it bounces off what you're trying to measure so a bullet an arrow whatever and if uh and if the and if the frequency of that um waveform changes enough they basically can calculate the the um velocity that that object is moving at um let's see real world example would be a racetrack if you're yeah, if you're close yeah. to the racetrack, and you hear that race car coming in, what does it sound like, Tony? Can you do an impression? Mm-mm. Yeah, come on. I don't know. All right. I've never been to a racetrack. Jim, but you love it's car kind of a dull roar as it comes <laughs> up on you. Like yeah. you and see then it, it coming, and, and then, then it, you're like, that should be louder. But then like it gets to you, and then it goes away from you, and the sound changes, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this. You hear this engine kind of screaming at a high frequency. That moment that it's right by you, that race car, it's going to sound like you know it would to the driver and then when it's speeding away from you it's usually a lower frequency or sort mm-hmm. of like this 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 um you know kind yeah of sound. yeah so um that's that's the doppler effect that you're that you're hearing and you contrast that with um something that's also moving fast but you're a long way away from like a like an airplane in the sky or maybe a train off in the distance it's going to sound the same the whole time because you're that Doppler effect is is uh, a function of um, how close you are to the direction of travel. Okay. So when we talk about setting this guy up and trying to align him, you know, using some of the provisions they give to align it uh, and how close it needs to be to the barrel, that's sort of the same deal where that Doppler effect that it's leveraging to get that information is going to be more accurate if you are close to the axis of travel um, of that projectile versus far away um but yeah that's what it's doing it's it's using sound waves to to bounce off of a projectile and and um make make calculations of its velocity based on how that frequency changes it seems extraordinarily complex when something already existed that did the job yeah (laughs) i'm not gonna lie yeah um i mean wow what about so and this is the whole thing 
right here. We're looking at it. Yep, that's the whole thing. Stand okay. that it's on. Yep. Yeah, you can get a tripod like the one I've got. I've got a tripod piece that fits mm-hmm. on them. Okay. And then, thing. so I mean, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll probably have a clear picture of what we're talking about here. But um, and you're setting this up at your location. So you're setting up next to your like just to Next the to right. right or left of your shooting position yeah like right at the muzzle and then just off to the side okay um so that's one thing we should probably point out like mm-hmm. i think these are 15 feet i, th- I think 15 sounds right the light this is at, this is at the muzzle mm-hmm. that's at the muzzle uh, for mm-hmm. all intents and purposes so you're actually getting a muzzle velocity with the with the last two we talked about you're getting an approximation that's 15 feet away with these guys and I think normal high-speed um, rifle cartridges, you're going to lose 20 feet per second probably in those 15 feet. Yeah. It sounds like a lot, but it, it, it degrades real quick um, at mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. Let's do a little switcheroo here, too, for those who are watching so they can maybe see this elaborator a little better. Um, now, so something that's so sensitive to sound, I mean, you have to have, you have, to, uh, have a device that's super sensitive to sound if it's sending out these microwaves that are inaudible to the human ear uh, and and or at least imperceptible by the human brain or something uh and it's it's using those to track such a tiny little uh bullet going down range all that stuff um you're setting it at the muzzle how are you not blowing the thing's eardrums out I, how does it even have the wherewithal to differentiate the sound of a blast from whatever this doppler effect is so so some of them it depends on like what you have. So if you like run a muzzle brake, okay, you can set it back onto it because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get it basically to get this to go. You're trying to get to, you're, you're waking it up by the, the, by the, the blast is really what's going. You can go off of um, two different modes. There's Doppler and then there's basically sound. So it, catch, it gets either or um, with different settings in it. Um, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to wake it up to tell it, hey, something's going down range. Ch- uh, catch that, catch that, you know. So when you arm it, um, it's just waiting for that, just kind of like trigger. this one's here to trigger it. Mm-hmm. It's trigger or that's right, trigger or Doppler. So, um, it's just waiting for that piece to go, that projectile to go down, do it down range, and it picks it up. How far down can it uh, sense? Hundred yards. Yeah. So you want to do it at a hundred. So impressive. you can you can choose which which distances you want it to measure for you mm-hmm. at anywhere between zero and a hundred, up to five data points. I think maybe. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I usually do, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, something like that. Um, and why would, you, why would you need to measure it more than once? Well, you can, you can s- get more information if you measure it more than once to, say, to make conclusions about your ballistic coefficient, like how, how fast am I slowing down, hmm. supposed, supposedly compared to, you know, how fast should I be slowing down if I use the published BC. Gotcha. Yeah. So gotcha. somebody developed this thing with muzzle velocity being just sort of a consequential cool thing that you could get with it, but it offers you the ability to get all kinds of other stuff too, like data points way down range. Well, yeah. Way down, but down range. Yeah, far enough. And it's got regimes, so you can set it to archery, and it will it will optimize you know how it operates for a specific velocity regime. I think it's um, like 60 to... 600 feet per second or something like that and then pistol is another is another one and that's something else 500 air rifle. to air rifles another one yeah oh. so oh wow it'll make it you know a little bit more accurate or it'll give it some some uh you know starting point for i'm supposed to be looking for a projectile that's going so fast yeah i mean that's another i guess a plus for a person who's maybe Maybe I don't only shoot. Maybe I'm, you know, I shoot and I'm bow hunting or Mm -hmm. whatever. You're able to use a single device to, you know, essentially get the velocity or a ballistic, help you ascertain like a ballistic curve for your arrow or your rifle. Yeah, Yeah, with the the Magneto speed over here, it's pretty much going only on rifles. Yeah. It's not going to go on a pistol. It's not going to go on a bow. Um you know, and, and Did you a put nod. It on a pistol? I've never thought about a it. A nod to the old school. I mean, it depends on the pistol, oh. maybe. Yeah, um, I think you like could. Like some old pirate gun, you could probably put it on the other. <laughs> <end>. <laughs> uh, but there's a nod to the old school light ones, though. Yeah. At least you could shoot an oh, arrow. Sure. You could shoot a pistol yeah. through mm-hmm. it. You kind of sh- anything that can fit through it. You could. You could yeah. do. But um, yeah. yeah. The other thing that's a that's a nod to those ones is when when I shoot on our indoor uh, hundred yard shooting range, I can't get I can't get the lab radar to work because. 
you know, we've got concrete walls and steel baffles and um, yep. it's just, there's too much reflected sound wave and it gets confused. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. That yeah. is interesting. It, it will not pick up. It'll, yeah. it'll say error or something like that. Yeah. It cannot detect or whatever. Hmm. With these kind of uh, light based ones, Jim, you're like, oh, you could get your aero velocity, which you really could. But what's really interesting to me with the, the lab radar, with the Doppler, is those multiple readings that Ian was talking about to really refine the ballistic curve. Like, you're in a, like more of a snapshot of your velocity yep. with this one. With that one, I think you could really, you know, get a very accurate sight tape. And it's really mm-hmm. going as far as you would realistically yep. be shooting at. Yeah, uh, it's pretty cool. At um, at most in most game situations, I'd say with a bow. So um, Tony was mentioning uh, sometimes if you're shooting at a public range or just you have, your buddies are shooting next to you, it's looking for a sound signature to to cue off of, <clears throat> and it can erroneously pick up you know someone else's shot on you. Right? You've had that oh, happen all the time. Yeah. So there are a few startup companies that have sort of developed these mechanical triggers or even uh, centrifugal triggers that you can hook into the uh, the micro USB and then just Velcro to your rifle so that thing gets woken up as soon as your rifle recoils. So it's not looking for a sound anymore. Set it to the trigger function. And that seems to be pretty foolproof. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, because, cool. you know, I mean, not everybody has the luxury of having a private range yeah, when you're right. the only one there. Or... Yeah, and, and then going to matches, like, if you're – it always seems like every time you're about ready to shoot, someone else shoots, and then you're just like, oh, so you have to reset it, and they have to get rid of that, get rid of that muzzle <laughs> yeah, velocity. Yeah, get rid of theirs. Because you'll look up, and the muzzle velocity, like, because they're off to the side, so it's not getting a, a true muzzle velocity. It's not getting yours. It's getting a guy that's three down, and so you get, like, a 1586 for muzzle velocity. You're like, I'm running about 3,000 feet a second. <laughs> like, that's something I can't be right, you know? So that's where that's where that one really does shine on the that mosquitoes. one. mosquitoes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I say it all the time. Mark, it's the th- yeah, it's magneto fine. speed. I call it. Mis- I always call. It, I endearingly call it the mosquito <laughs> speed, and then I can't stop saying. No, it, it and just is. There's a big power consumption difference between those two as well. Like a little nine volt will take you all summer long with the uh, mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> but this thing, I run a battery pack. You, ha- you almost have to. You have to run a battery pack. So it'll go off of here, uh, double A's. But it's almost like that's your last resort. Mine's my backup. Yeah. So piece- what battery pack are you? I use running with it. Just like a cell, like a cellular battery. It's like a um, 300 to 600 milliamp rechargeable. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I, so I Velcro the side and I stick the stick it on the side and it runs into um, into your power source underneath there. Okay. Just, so you just plug it in. It's a simple plug in. And it does last for quite a while, but that's, like I said, we, you know, we're kind of talking plus and minuses and, and it's, you know, it has to take batteries of some sort, but, you know, it's a little harder on the batteries as yeah. in line with the magneto speed that like, you can say it lasts for quite a while. But I, I I finally was like, I'm just getting a battery pack. Right. I don't even think Everyone I run does. batteries anymore. Everyone does. I don't think so. I run double A's. What if, um, what if you're using this thing and, you know, like a Tweety Bird flies by and then it's just going to Doppler that, you know, or something? I mean, we've talked about things that can, outside forces that can affect the light ones. Um, I don't know how many there were, if any, that could affect the magneto speed here. Maybe if you're next to, uh, you know, like the North Pole or something. I don't oh, yeah, know. what about... Those uh, sensors are so directional that, yeah, I don't okay. think... But with this thing, I mean, there's other things that could be flying through the air between you and 100 yards. Could that affect it? It's, it's got to have the sh- it's gotta have the shock. Okay. To okay. Off, to really to, to wake it up, I should say, kind of. I don't think it'll... I've never had anything else get picked up by mine never. i've never had anything get picked up either um no usually that's not a problem hmm. um the mild annoyances like the trigger will time out and you'll right shoot when you, and, right when you, yeah <laughs> right when you think that you're like all right i'm good and you look up and it's Time it, already, it times up so yeah. i just set mine to like max because you yeah. have a you're able to adjust the timer and t- to how long you want it to run but then plus and minus when that's running like that you're so is your, draining your so battery, is your battery. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. with the with I got one question with the lab radar maybe versus the magneto speed with the magneto speed you've got like the little thing or the little you know your black box that's giving you your readings you shoot five shots you know you hit the buttons you get your standard deviation between those shots you know crunches the numbers get your velocity <clears throat> how does that work with the lab radar unit 
There's just, a screen over here. Just the yeah. screen. Just a screen. You I just, didn't know if it relayed to an app at all or anything um, like there's that. There's an app or... for it. I never use the app. I run off the screen, but it's, okay. it's the, the setup is um, it's pretty quick on. Oh, Tony, um, what did I do? Yeah, it's it's the wrong dovetail. It's kind of it's, it's got to push it rigged. You got to push it in this side. It'll all um, go in halfway. So no, you, when you get done, it'll tell you um, like the same thing. Like all your shots, um, it'll take you to a home screen. It'll give you all your standard deviation. Um, muzzle velocity all off of one screen. Gotcha. And so you just you have that face. You know, this is the side that's facing you as the shooter, so you can manipulate yep. the buttons, get your readouts. Maybe just reach up and hit it. And yeah. So there's an app for both uh, lab really radar. Looks like it's gonna fall by the way. Hundred percent looks like yeah. it's gonna fall over. I totally should not that's have touched the, it. You, you Scott Parks did. Oh, here, let me see that. Oh, it's broken. Oh, here. hey, nice oh, thing. Let me yeah. take it apart. Yeah, now it's back. Here's yeah, here, yours. Here's, here's your, your problem. Here's your toy back. Uh, um, what did you say? Your last question. <laughs> Well, I was just talking about, you know, get getting your readouts and then, uh, you know, like how often oh, are you? Oh, the app. Ian was oh, talking the about app. apps. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. There's an app for that. Yeah. yeah. The, it seems like it's pretty good for the magneto speed, uh, but, uh, you know, whether it's on your iOS or, or Android or whatever, but the, the lab radar seems to be just a little bit finicky in my in my experience, I just, I just use you just use the there. regular screen, yeah. and it also has an SD card reader, so you can put an SD card, get all yep. your f get all your data in a I forget what type of file it is, but it'll plug right into Excel, and if you want to graph data, that's kind of handy. Hmm. What about a situation? You know, I guess we kind of primarily keep talking about the the lab radar and the magneto speed, where maybe I've got five rifles and I want a chrono five rifles or. Jim and I are together and we want to chrono our rifles or maybe we're in a group. Is the lab radar like easier? Like, is it, would it be faster to do multiple rifles? So on that one, so I know we're talking about this. So the downfall we had talked about before is that you, let's say you go to your public rifle range, right? If you have to set these up, you know, you're shutting the range down. It's on your time off. And, and if you're you have one the problem, light based, light traditional, based ones, because, because you're you setting them set 15 them. feet down range or 15, 18 feet down range, so you got to do that for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the for the bayonet, we kind of talked about the really the only only issue with it was is the resetting up. So let's say you're running a heavier barrel and you're running a lighter barrel, and now we got to mess with the shims yeah. piece. Mm -hmm. um, or suppressor. The, or suppressor. Yeah. yeah. Or and then you take the lab radar. The nice thing about the lab radar is you have five people and you're seriously just setting it down to everyone. You're picking it up and just setting it down to the next person, shooting theirs, setting it down, and shooting the next person. Um, that is nice. Yeah, I I, I took mine to the uh, PRS finale the first year I got it, and the guy said, "Hey, can I borrow it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, cool." And um, there's still pictures of it because I have my name. Because I it's not because I'm afraid someone's gonna steal stuff. My stuff. If ever see my stuff, it's got my name on everything. Like in great, it's so when I leave it somewhere, because I'll forget it. That <laughs> someone someone knows who who left it. Um, so on mine, I've got a, I had a piece of tape up there, and it's so handy. Apparently, we came back and I had like eighty profiles on it. So we, then we look up at the, <laughs> at, the, at the at the series at the at the end of um, this was a couple three two three years ago, and I suddenly start looking at these photos that that an individual takes for uh, the PRS series, and. I see this in my labrators and I get ever, I'm like, who's that guy? I didn't know who the guy is. So it just got just passed around at, <laughs> at, at, at this thing. I came back, there's like 80 profiles on this, on, on, on my labrador. I didn't even fire one of them on there. I cleaned it just for that match. And here it comes back with like 83 files. I think it was, or 83 different profiles on it when I got it back. And I was like, it was gone for a while. I let one guy borrow it. That's and proof the, that it's really handy. It's that the is, most, the yes. most handy. Yeah. So, and, not, and not I guess saying, probably also just user friendly for that many people to yeah. be able to figure it out in short order. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, but if you have one of those arms like I was talking about earlier with the magneto, guys let me borrow that uh one time this year at the at the finale. I, so, I could I couldn't get that I couldn't get it in. He's like, here just plug this into your you know, onto your um onto the stock. It would just fit right on my Arca. So describe um, the, describe that a little bit and why why that came to be. Why did someone invent that accessory? Well, because they didn't well i think there's two parts of it they wanted to get the speed back out of it they wanted to kind of i think they wanted to eliminate the shim piece of it because this is you, in regards to the magneto speed yeah in, right? in regards to magneto so i think they want to kind of get rid of the shim piece but i also think that they like the idea of what i was talking about before what i'd use this for is i want to see how well my my hand loading is doing so i want to be able to shoot a targets i'd normally shoot at anyway and but i want to know what how good my hand loading is doing? Am I getting a am I getting a solid SD out of 
the 60 shots that I wanted to, to mm. shoot that day um, or out to distance. I wanted to, to do that. I think that's where that piece came in with the magneto so why they built that arm. What you're talking about, this arm, it attaches to a part of your rifle yep. that wouldn't influence the barrel. Correct. So like your stock or... Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, it so it's, it's like Arco or Picatinny. I've seen okay. a few of them on there. All right. Side. And it's long enough and presumably adjustable so that you can kind of have it outboard cantilevered. It, yeah, it's... it's it's actually kind of neat there. Like it'll be like a rod coming out, and then it'll be like a, a swivel, and then they got an arm, and they got another swivel. So it's almost like they have this erector, like the erector set, yeah. you know, back go, in the go day. Gadget man, you know yeah. speed. <laughs> or they're, 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 they can they can they can move it all the way where they need to, um, where would normally set up on your rifle without yeah. it affecting your harmonics whatsoever on your. Nice. I like gotcha. that. I like that concept. Yeah. It's it's the first time I saw one. It was actually really neat. But I mean, it's, it helped me because I couldn't. I brought the lab radar. I couldn't get it set up because there's the the firing line was so small there's so many shooters that if you fire it and it'd be like mm. you're just non-stop it's just setting it off and you're never gonna get you're never gonna get a, tr- a correct muzzle velocity yeah you know or a true muzzle velocity gotcha and with a system like that that's or i'm the way i'm picturing it the way you're describing it it, it might be somewhat limited to like more of a like a precision rifle with an arc or like how like let's say you just had a standard hunting rifle and you wanted to do that would there be a way to attach it I, I don't know. That, like, yeah. I, would, I mean, I, to, I don't know. You'd have to improvise, yeah. I think. you got to make a Duct new cloth for a hunting rifle. Okay. <laughs> so a PRS gun. A PRS <laughs> gun okay. that just has a camo pattern on the stuff. Oh, that's what made it good for <laughs> hunting. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this, this Doppler technology, isn't that what people are now using? You can see applied ballistics with the custom drag models and stuff. They pull out this giant set up it's it's like this on mega steroids and yeah then they can see what the bullet's doing way down range and yeah these so custom bc like the, the idea of a custom bc is weird your bc is always one because it's all it's yeah it's, so that's they're spending the the dollars to be able to measure uh further down range yeah so if you wanted to to get the best data to build that custom drag curve possible you'd want to make sure your data set wasn't in the first hundred yards You'd want to ensure that it was, you know, well, well beyond that. Because um, if you try to measure, you know, if you had if you had something this long, you try to measure this much of it and then extrapolate the rest of it. There's opportunity to error mm-hmm. for error. Oh, yeah. down there. Okay, yeah. gotcha. So it goes back to the same thing you're talking about with those bench rest guys. Yep, Abs- um, absolutely. So, are there any are there any other, ki- other kind of chronographs that we just don't have on the table here, though? Or is this kind of the main? You These are the mainstream ones. There's probably some weird light Leonardo da Vinci one that I don't know about. Sound. Or ones that are beyond expensive that the consumer wouldn't really want to. Yeah. You know, it isn't like the, was like an Oler 88. It wasn't like that, the, the yeah. standard back in the day. And That's the one that had the little printout with the receipt paper that would spit oh, out I your had, data. I, had, I think I had a packed one at one time that, that oh, had really? that. I thought it was pretty aw- I thought it was pretty awesome. Sounds yeah. awesome. Like, uh, here like you go. You know, label I, maker. Yeah. It's basically just spitting out like here you go, you yeah. know, because <laughs> you had the coolest one on the block. But it, like I said, it's the setup time and the the fear of of, of sooner or later you're gonna hit the rods. Like I there's a re, there's a reason why they make replacement kits. It's not because that rusted through. You and know? also <laughs> this 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 one isn't for everyone. The lab radar I think is running now about five hundred and fifty dollars. Oh yeah, that's right. They're not cheap. Yeah, yeah. Not cheap. yeah. And you know you have to buy the stand separate and. A lot of guys are making sighting devices that will um, utilize the screw hole here up front because they mold in this notch that you're supposed to use like to kind of align. Like a iron sights. Like a, little claymore, oh. like a little claymore. It's miserable. It does not work very well. I wish I had more well. experience buying claymores to know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> relate. But. A lot of guys will take a soda straw and they'll just put it in that little divot and tape it on there so they have a peep sight no, to use. Say, yeah, peep sight. Yep. I, I took a piece of fiber wire like make for pistol for front sights you know you put your own and you burn your both ends Mm -hmm. i just did that that way i could have two big dots and i just because the the issue with this one is and that ian said perfectly is it's a sighting process because you're getting behind it and you're trying to eyeball well i can see the front but it's hard to see the end then you're trying to line up with your target and you just okay so you have to point it right at the target at 100 yards yeah so or wherever you're shooting uh, towards is where you want that to be aimed towards and normally it does a pretty good job once you get it set up it does a pretty good job on picking up uh, your rounds but I just took a like a uh, basically a fiber wire that you, uh, on my pistol you can burn the one end and then you, you know you cut the other end and you, you burn that back so it gives you two dots I just put one and I just glued it up on, on the top here nice. and so that way I've got basically a, a fiber sight um, to look down range on it 
Tony was mentioning that these Dopplers are sensitive to shock. Um, and I've noticed with my big ELR rifle, big break on it, a lot of gas coming out the side. I can't use this in the conventional way where it's sitting upright like this next to the rifle because it just gets yep. blown, you know, knocked around too much. So I actually have to come up with a tripod that cantilevers this thing sideways over top in the 12 o'clock position above the oh, rifle wow. where it doesn't have any gas hmm. ports. And then it'll pick up the shot, but that's the only way I can get it to register. Whereas the the Magneto, you know, it's got to cut that nice divot um, down here. It lets those gases escape, and, of course, it's not really affected by um, shock, pure shock. So, so nice. Yeah, for the – for the I used it uh, for testing um, uh, muzzle velocity on a Barrett uh, 107. So that one I had to put it because of the giant brakes that are on the, one, on the 107, a big giant tank brake. I would set it um, about muzzle here, and then I'd set the lab radar about where you're, you're in a pick them up just fine. In Be- front or behind? The- in front of the gun. Okay. Oh, wow. In front, oh, and, and it, oh and since it, and those gas it. ports are angled Yeah, because you just, <laughs> yeah. I was like, ah, yeah, kind if you of, put it behind, it's kind of expensive. It's gonna get yeah, it's just going to get knocked over every time because of the blast coming on the side of that thing is insane. Um, so I set it in front, and it still picked it up just fine, and it didn't take any beating. That it would have if I would have put it off to the side where traditionally I put it on all my other really all my other guns. Nice. So. Definitely a lot to consider, you know, when you're selecting between the two or how you're going to use it or where you're going to be using it predominantly. Some things uh, that maybe on the surface you're like, oh, this is the perfect solution. Then you go to use it where you're going to be. And you're like, well, this isn't working that great. Right. So. Right. If I had all the money in the world, I would have this and that. <laughs> yep. Uh, because the and the main, you just yeah, speak, because of that that whole indoor range. You know, uh, acoustic um, phenomenon with the with the lab radar. I'd still need the magneto. They, they do both have sort of mutually exclusive pros and cons. Yes, yeah. they do. Which is, um, they do. Yeah, and so they're both really good at what they do. They are just different. They are. So yeah, answer both. I'm trying to think of uh, an idea in my head that could be like both of them combined. It would look something like that Just donut that you used to have around the barrel of your... Oh, no, that would end up tuning the barrel. Never mind. Yeah. So I have used both of those at the same time because I wanted to judge them against each other for accuracy. Oh, we yeah. talked about sort of advertised mm-hmm. plus or minus 5% here. I think Labrador advertises plus or minus 0.1% and Magneto is like 0.1 to 0.5%. Uh, but I just wanted to see, okay, what? how do they compare? And out of 40 rounds, the biggest delta I had between them was three feet per second. Smallest, of course, was zero. They had identical velocities. But normally it was around one or two feet per second difference between the two devices. And I was floored by that. That's confidence yeah. inspiring. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Three right. feet per second. At big deal or not a big deal? At 3,000 feet per second. Niles you know, would not. be pulling his hair out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's probably working on that right now. Mind. But no, it was like, okay, I don't have to ever worry about which one I have with me because yep. it's going to give me the same number. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, there's some good stuff in here, guys. I'm glad we went over all this. Mark, do you have anything else on your piece of paper? Uh, I mean, nothing too crazy. I think we pretty much covered it all, you know, and, and uh, I know I definitely learned a few things about both systems, like I said, my previous or my experience mostly falls within the magneto speed, but yep. uh, definitely have some uses for the lab radar. I'm will probably be borrowing this as I get my bow a little bit, hopefully more dialed in this summer. That might be fun to play with. And then I guess you know, out of just curious, like how often are you guys chronoing your rifles? Good like, question. Is this something you're doing once, set it and forget it? I'm good to go. You're doing it all the time. Great question. I think in general, the crowd I hang out with uses them too much. Like <laughs> most guys, they don't shoot unless they have this big orange thing set up next to them. It's their security blanket or they just like seeing the numbers, like seeing, okay, my SD is still good. A month later, okay, my SD is still good. It's yeah. kind of a, yeah, I could say you could get hooked on that. Yeah, I lived without it for so long that I care about what the target is telling me. Am I shooting small or not? And then every once in a while, I'll pull it out to say, okay, what velocity do I need to make mm-hmm. sure I hit? the next time I change primer lots or bullets or something mm-hmm. else. Or what so. about even just the life cycle of the gun? Like I've got X amount of rounds through Ooh, this yeah. barrel. Maybe I've I'm getting a higher velocity. Totally now, forgot about that. So you remember the barrel episode where we talked about sort of breaking in barrels mm-hmm. yeah. and how they speed up in the early stages of their life? I like to set that up when I'm 
shooting the first 100 to 150 rounds so that I can tell like, yep, it's picking up. Yep, I've I've, I'm now 40 feet per second faster, 50 feet per second faster, and now it's tapered off. I know that it's not going to keep speeding up. It's kind of hit that plateau. Yeah, and sometimes that happens at 80 rounds. Sometimes it happens at 120 rounds. But I kind of like to know when that happens because the barrels are so precious that I don't want to shoot it more than I need to. Yeah. Once it's sped up, I can, okay, I'm going to do my tuning for real now. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. you can kind of watch that Mm -hmm. that velocity curve, if you will, I guess. Yeah, so for me, in my use case, I use it... Uh, for the first like two or three range sessions pretty religiously and then I just sort of once I have that characteristic velocity I just sort of forget that I that that exists and I just try okay. to shoot um I'm the security blanket guy that uh he was talking I'm about sorry <laughs> <laughs> no um so off of mine I know that when I get so for my rifle I shoot uh, six creed been shooting it for quite a while and I know that it loves so I know that it loves 2950 feet a second. So that's where I try to get the gun to shoot. And I know that it tunes well at 2950. I don't know what it is. It just does. It has always since I've gotten it. So I, that's my kind of my goal with, with the, with that is I want to know is if I'm back here, did I mess with my powder? Did my powder get, we're in Wisconsin. It's humid. Did for some reason I have, my powder get different my brass change i want to know that when i go to a match i'll take it with it'll it's been on the air many of the airplanes and uh i'll, I'll check it just it is my last security blanket type thing which i'm all about i mean it's oh if, yeah if, if you and if you do and I, I don't think there's like you know, people that really don't go there and in, in chrono just because you want you're moving to another part of the country you know part of the country so you're like why not just r- throw it down it's simple Mm-hmm. Um, right. and, and, and run it to make sure that my muzzle velocity is still there because especially being outside with me loading up 300 rounds is my, is my rounds hot is, is, is everything good. So that's when I just take it and I just lay it down and I go, yep, it's good. And it gets used a lot. So, um, but, but I, I like knowing that my muzzle velocity is, is when I checked it, when I left, mm-hmm. it's still there. All my numbers are still, should still be good on my, on my Kestrel. Mm-hmm. Well, I so. imagine too, if you do have a round or maybe for whatever reason, a, a handful of rounds that appear to be doing consistently doing the same thing at this new location, yep. you can more quickly determine what might be going on. Right. It could be just you or it could be like, oh man, for whatever reason, I'm, yeah. I've got a higher velocity. Maybe I'm, we're at 10,000 feet and we were at 1,000 foot elevation, whatever, you know I mean? Right. It answers that question before it's even asked. So you're not wondering. And yeah. That, yeah. And and with the tuner system, if I know that my, Ian touched on earlier, if my muzzle velocity has changed, my tune is now changed. Right. So if I'm still, if I left here at 2950 and I go there and I'm shooting something different, I know that I need to adjust a tuner, my tuner to compensate. To compensate. A bit. Yeah, bring it back into tune. Yep. Bring it back into tune. How about that? Or if you're a knucklehead and you bring uh, two different lots of ammo to a PRS <laughs> match that are 100 <laughs> foot per second different out of your gun, uh, that's a good time to have a chronograph on you, too. It is. Yes, that <laughs> could be handy, Jim. Uh, Purely hypothetical. That was a good question, though. Glad you asked that one there. That's all I got, Jim. If anybody else has any other questions around chronographs and stuff, any of the ones that are on the table here, definitely hit us up in the uh, comments if, you, if you've been watching on YouTube or over on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Uh, what's your favorite chronograph to use, though? Also, let us know that. Um, Ian and uh, Tony, thank you very much. Appreciate you guys for joining us. Cheers. Yeah, everybody, sure. we will see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So was that a little foreboding about the PRS pod venture? What what happened or? Oh, that well, yeah, that was some. That was a little bit of a. Uh, I guess a, hint a reference. It. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I did. I grabbed. Uh, I grabbed. We were like, we need six five Creed. I went down to the range, and there was brown boxes of it and white boxes of it, and I'm like, six five Creed more. So I grabbed like three how, brown boxes and one white and one white box, and Nick goes, "What's that?" And I'm like, 6.5 Crete. And he goes, no, 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 why is that one different? He goes, is that the same lot? I'm like, probably not. I mean, they're different boxes, for God's sakes, Nick. You, you can know. homogenize them if you put them in a bucket and sort of stir them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then they'll all find you yeah. know, some middle ground. He goes, well, let's run that through the chrono just to be safe. I'm like, Nick is just PRSing again. And, uh, <laughs> PRSing. Yeah, well, we run it through the chrono, and sure enough, there's a 100-foot-per-second difference between the two lots of ammo. I was Both shot. shot 
I was shot. shot. Both shot. shot nice. They wow. both shot okay. Um, but yeah, I was like, mm, okay, well, that's the difference a lot can make. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what match well, did you go to? The Vengeance match in um, Kinderdale, Pennsylvania. Just recently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, the hardest one of the season. Yeah, Apparently like the that worst Nick one. wanted to throw us to the wolves and nice. super fun. Oh, yeah, I, I bet really enjoyed really myself. Shot the Wisconsin one. Oh, there oh, was the a lot we should have shot. Yeah. For Cor- our first correct. Hey, correct. For our first PRS <laughs> match, there's a lot we should have shot, uh, but we did that one. It was fun. We, I mean, we got our asses kicked, but it was fun. Yeah, good. So yeah, it's tougher to look. So you think you can go there and you're like, oh, you know, you shoot and then, you know, you go there and the the, the thing is, everybody's like, how'd you do? And you're like, ah, oh, shot, you know, whatever, eighth, ninth, tenth. In reality, in general, like, that's actually pretty excellent sense. Most of the matches oh, yeah. are won by two points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, from first to second is a point or two on uh, almost every one. Yeah. When I first, first started shooting them, I started shooting them before their PRS in 2006 or 2007. If you were shooting 50% at that time, you're probably going to be in, like, the top five. Now, you, if you're not shooting probably 90%, right? 80 Low 90s, you will not even be in the top 20. Mm-hmm. It's nuts. That's what happens when people start competing. It's 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 just, it's just it's, and then, and then technology. I mean, back in the day, we were we had dope charts, right? We didn't have Kestrel. I mean, the first thing that ever came out was the Palm Pilot with uh, work with me on this on this. Uh, Oh, you know the program too, the ballistic program. But it's a Palm Pilot, you know, yeah. which would shut down because of the overload of data that you're putting <laughs> on the Palm Pilot. I used to have one too. I can't think of the heck of the name it was on it. But that was like the first ballistic computer, and that wasn't even like all it was was information that you're plugging into the system. It's the same thing we were doing with the iPhone, basically. Yeah. Let me ask you this: since you have that experience on both ends of the spectrum, which was more fun? The simple days or the newfangled technology days? I think the new angle technology days because no one likes to miss. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I Missing that. sucks. And the thing is, too, is that having that ability to, like, give an example of just, just a simple hand loading of what I've learned over the years to make my rifle more accurate. Sure. You know, for me, changing from one thing like, oh, I thought I've got this down, no problem. And then just the simple methods of just simple hand, simple techniques and hand loading, which has made. Your rifle go from, you know, what you thought back in the day, oh, I got a three-quarter minute gun. That's awesome. Well, That's now I'll, retu- I'll tune it. The sucker shoots dime-sized groups. You yeah. Because you can. You have the ability to, to run a tuner. tuner. Everyone was running when it first started, but he's like, oh, let's go short barrels. Remember that short barrel theme? Everyone was shooting 308. Super short barrels. As short as they can super get them. Super stiff. Yeah, they, 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 it, was, it was a thing. And uh, now everybody's changed all back. Now you're shooting 24, 26-inch barrels. On six grade more. I mean, back in the day, they were shooting two forty three. Is like, is like, but it's just a barrel burner. Mm-hmm. But everyone was shooting like Tony Jamali, him and Rob Orban were shooting two forty threes. But and they're beating against three hundred eight. We're like, yeah, you know. I mean, you're shooting a two forty three against a three hundred eight. You better win. You know, type deal. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.